Chapter 12 As the long winter ended, the tempo of the clan's life increased to match the pace of life quickening within the rich earth. The cold season enforced not a true hibernation, but an alteration in metabolic rates brought about by reduced activities. In winter, they were more sluggish, slept more, ate more, causing an insulating layer of subcutaneous fat to develop as protection against the cold. With a rise in temperature, the trend was reversed, making the clan restless and eager to be out and moving. The process was assisted by Isa's spring tonic, composed of triticum roots collected early in spring from the coarse grass that resembled rye, dried woodruff leaves, and iron-rich yellow dock root powder, administered universally to young and old alike by the clan's medicine woman. With new vigor, the clan burst out of the cave ready to begin a new cycle of seasons. The third winter in the cave had not been too hard on them. The only death was over a stillborn child, and that didn't count because it had never been named and accepted. Isa, no longer drained by the demands of nursing a hungry baby, had weathered it well. Kreb had suffered no more than usual. Both Aga and Ika were pregnant again, and since both women had given birth successfully before, the clan looked forward to its increase. The first green shoots and buds were gathered, and an early hunt planned to provide fresh meat for a spring feast to honor the spirits that awaken new life, and to give thanks to the spirits of the clan's protective totems for seeing them through another winter. Ayla felt she had special reason to give thanks to her totem. The winter had been both trying and exciting. She grew to hate Browd even more intensely, but she learned she could cope with him. He had thrown his worst at her, and she had learned to take it in stride. There was a limit beyond which even Browd could not go. Learning more of Isa's healing magic helped. She loved it. The more she learned, the more she wanted to learn. She found she was as eager to search out the medicinal plants for their own uses, now that she understood them better, as to use plant gathering as a means of escape. As long as the bitter winds and icy blizzards blew, she waited patiently. But with the first hints of change, restless anticipation set in. She looked forward to this spring more than any spring she could remember. It was time to learn to hunt. As soon as the weather allowed, Ayla took to the woods and fields. She stopped hiding her sling in the small cave near her practice meadow. She kept it with her, tucked into a fold of her wrap or beneath a layer of leaves in her collecting basket. Teaching herself to hunt was not easy. Animals were quick and elusive, and moving targets far more difficult to hit than stationary ones. The women always made noise when they were out gathering, to scare off any lurking animals, and it was a hard habit to break. Many times she became angry with herself for warning an animal of her approach when she caught a glimpse of one darting for cover. But she was determined, and with practice she learned. Through trial and error, she learned to track and began to understand and apply the bits of hunting lore gleaned from the men. Her eye was already trained to pick up small details that differentiated plants, and it took only an extension to learn to define the meaning in the telltale droppings of an animal, a faint print in the dust, a bent blade of grass, or a broken twig. She learned to distinguish the spore of different animals became familiar with their habits and habitats. Though she didn't overlook the herbivorous species, she concentrated on the carnivores, her chosen prey. She watched to see which way the men went when they left to go hunting, but it was not Brun and his hunters that gave her the most concern. More often than not, they chose the steppes as their hunting ground, and she didn't dare try to hunt the open plains with no cover. It was the two older men she worried about most. She had seen Zug and Dorv occasionally when she was foraging for Isa in the past. They were the ones she was most likely to find hunting the same terrain as herself. She had to be constantly on her guard to avoid them. Even starting out in the opposite direction was no guarantee they wouldn't double back and catch her with a sling in her hands. But as she learned to move silently... 
she sometimes followed them to watch and learn. She was especially careful then. It was more dangerous for her to track the trackers than the objects of their pursuit. It was good training, however. She learned to move noiselessly as much from following the men as from trailing the animals, and could melt into a shadow if one happened to glance her way. As Ayla gained skill tracking, learning to move with stealth, trained her eye to discern a shape within its camouflaged cover, there were times when she was sure she could have hit a small animal. Though she was tempted, if it was not carnivorous, she passed it by without trying. She had made her decision to hunt only predators, and her totem sanctioned only those. Spring buds became blossoms and leafed out the trees, blossoms fell and fruits swelled from their hearts, hanging half-grown and green, and still Ayla had not killed her first animal. Get out! Shoo! Scat! Ayla started out of the cave to see what the commotion was about. Several women were waving their arms and chasing after a short, squat, shaggy animal. The wolverine headed toward the cave, but veered aside with a snarl when it saw Ayla. It dodged between the women's legs and escaped with a strip of meat in its jaws. That sneaky glutton! I just put that meat out to dry! Oga gesticulated in angry frustration. I hardly turned my back. He's been hanging around here all summer, getting braver every day. I wish Zug would get him. It's a good thing you were just coming out, Ayla. He almost ran into the cave. Think what a stink he would have left if he'd gotten cornered in there. I think your he is a she, Oga, and probably has a nest somewhere nearby. I guess she has several hungry babies that must be getting pretty big by now. That's all we need. A bunch of them. Angry words punctuated her gestures. Zuck and Dorf took Vorn with them early this morning. I wish they'd gone hunting for that wolverine instead of hamsters and ptarmigan down below. Gluttons are good for nothing. They're good for something, Oga. Their fur doesn't frost up from your breath in winter. Their pelts make good hats and hoods. I wish that one were a pelt. Ayla started back to the hearth. There was really nothing she had to do then, and Isa did say she was running low on a few things. Ayla decided to go out and find the wolverine's nest. She smiled to herself and quickened her step, and shortly afterward left the cave with her basket, heading into the forest not far from the place where the animal had gone. Scanning the ground, she spied the print of a claw with long, sharp nails in the dust. A little farther on, a bent stem. Ayla started trailing the creature. In a few moments, she heard scuttling sounds, surprisingly close to the cave. She moved ahead softly, hardly disturbing a leaf, and caught sight of the wolverine with four half-grown young, snarling and bickering over the strip of stolen meat. Carefully, she withdrew her sling from a fold of her wrap and fitted a stone into the bulging pocket. She waited, watching for a chance at a clean shot. A stray shift in the wind brought a strange scent to the wily glutton. She looked up, sniffing the air, alerted to possible danger. It was the moment Ayla was waiting for. Quickly, even as the animal caught the movement... She hurled the stone. The wolverine slumped to the ground as the four young bounded off, startled by the bouncing rock. She stepped out of the concealing brush and stooped to examine the scavenger. The bear-like weasel was about three feet long from its nose to the tip of its bushy tail, with coarse, long, blackish-brown fur. Wolverines were intrepid, scrappy scavengers, fierce enough to drive away predators larger than themselves from their kills, fearless enough to steal drying meat or anything portable they could carry off, and wily enough to break into storage caches. They had musk glands that left behind a skunk-like odor and were a bane to the clan even worse than the hyena who was as much predator as scavenger and didn't depend for his survival on the kills of others. The stone from Ayla's sling had landed above the eye, just where she aimed. 
This is one wolverine that won't steal from us anymore, Ayla thought, filled with a glow of satisfaction that verged on exultation. It was her first kill. I think I'll give the pelt to Oga, she thought, reaching for her knife to skin the animal. Won't she be glad to know it won't bother us anymore? The girl stopped. What am I thinking of? I can't give Oga this pelt. I can't give it to anyone. I can't even keep it. I'm not supposed to hunt. If anyone found out I killed this wolverine, I don't know what they'd do. Ayla sat down beside the dead glutton, pulling her fingers through its long, coarse coat. Her elation was gone. She had made her first kill. Maybe it wasn't a great bison killed with a heavy, sharp spear, but it was more than Vorn's porcupine. There would be no celebration marking her entrance into the ranks of the hunters, no feast held in her honor, not even the looks of praise and congratulation Vorn received when he proudly showed off his small game. If she returned to the cave with the wolverine, all she could expect would be shocked looks and severe punishment. It mattered little that she wanted to help the clan or that she was able to hunt and showed promise of doing well. Women did not hunt. Women did not kill animals. Men did. She heaved a sigh. I knew it. I knew it all along, she said to herself. Even before I started to hunt, before I ever picked up that sling, I knew I wasn't supposed to. The bravest of the young gluttons came out of its hiding place, tentatively sniffing at the dead animal. Those young ones are going to give us as much trouble as their mother, Ayla thought. They're close enough to full grown that a couple of them will survive. I'd better get rid of this carcass. If I drag it far away, the young will probably follow her scent. Ayla got up and began to haul the dead wolverine by its tail deeper into the woods. Then she started looking for plants to gather. The wolverine was only the first of the smaller predators and scavengers to fall to her sling. Martins, minks, ferrets, otters, weasels, badgers, ermines, foxes, and the small gray and black tabby-striped wildcats became fair game for her swift stones. She didn't realize it, but Ayla's decision to hunt predators had one important effect. It sped up her learning process and honed her skill far more than hunting the gentler herbivorous animals would have. Carnivores were faster, more crafty, more intelligent, and more dangerous. She quickly surpassed Vorn with her chosen weapon. It wasn't only that he tended to look upon the sling as an old man's weapon and lacked the determination to master it. It was more difficult for him. He didn't have her physical build with its free-swinging arm movement better adapted to throwing. Her full leverage and practiced hand and eye coordination gave her speed, force, and accuracy. She no longer compared herself with Vorn. In her mind, it was Zug whose ability she challenged, and the girl was fast approaching the old hunter's skill. Too fast. She was getting overconfident. Summer was nearing its end with its full charge of crackling heat and a bumper crop of lightning-singed thunderstorms. The day was hot, unbearably hot. Not the hint of a breeze stirred the still air. The previous evening's storm, with its fantastic displays of arcing flashes illuminating the mountain crests and with hail the size of small stones, had sent the clan scurrying into the cave. The damp forest, normally cool from the shade of the trees, was humid and stifling. Flies and mosquitoes droned interminably around the slimy ooze of the drying creek's backwater, trapped by lowered water levels into stagnant ponds and algae-coated puddles. Ayla was following the spoor of a red fox, moving silently through the woods near the edge of a small glade. She was hot and sweaty, not especially interested in the fox, 
and thinking about giving it up and going back to the cave to take a swim in the stream. Walking across the seldom exposed rocky bed, she stopped for a drink where the creek still ran freely between two large boulders that forced the meandering trickle into an ankle-deep pool. She stood up and, as she looked straight ahead, caught her breath in her throat. Ayla stared apprehensively at the distinctive head and tufted ears of a lynx crouched on the rock just in front of her. He was eyeing her warily, his short tail whipping back and forth. Smaller than most large felines, the long-bodied, short-legged Pardell lynx, like his northern cousin of later years, was capable of fifteen-foot standing leaps. He subsisted mainly on hares, rabbits, large squirrels, and other rodents, but could bring down a small deer if he felt so inclined. And an eight-year-old girl was easily within his range. But it was hot, and humans were not his normal prey. He would probably have let the girl go on her way. Ayla's first tingle of fear was replaced by a chill of excitement as she watched the unmoving cat watching her. Didn't Zug tell Vorn a lynx could be killed with a sling? He said not to try for anything larger, but he did say a stone from a sling could kill a wolf or hyena or lynx. I remember him saying lynx, she thought. She had not hunted the medium-sized predators but she wanted to be the best sling hunter in the clan. If Zug could kill a lynx, she could kill a lynx. And here, right in front of her, was the perfect target. On impulse, she decided the time had come for larger game. She reached slowly into the fold of her short summer wrap, never taking her eyes off the cat, and felt for her largest stone. Her palms were sweaty, but she gripped the two ends of the leather strap together tighter while she put the stone in the pocket. Then, quickly, before she lost her nerve, she aimed for a spot just between his eyes and flung the stone. But the lynx caught the motion as she raised her arm. He turned his head as she hurled. The rock grazed the side of his head, causing a sharp pain at the point-blank range, but little more. Before Ayla could think of reaching for another stone, she saw the cat's muscles bunch under him. It was with sheer reflex that she threw herself to the side as the annoyed lynx leapt for his attacker. She landed on the mud near the creek and her hand fell on a stout driftwood branch, churned clean of leaves and twigs by its journey downstream, waterlogged and heavy. Ayla clutched it and rolled over just as the angry lynx with fangs bared pounced again. Swinging wildly, with all the strength fear poured into her, she struck a solid blow, knocking his head aside. The stunned lynx rolled over, crouched for a moment shaking his head, then moved silently into the forest. He'd had enough hurting blows to his head. Ayla was shaking as she sat up, breathing hard. Her knees felt like water when she went to retrieve her sling and she had to sit down again. Zug had never imagined that anyone would attempt to hunt a dangerous predator with just a sling, with no other hunter or even another weapon as backup. But Ayla hardly ever missed her targets anymore. She had become too sure of her skill. She didn't think about what might happen if she missed. She was in such a state of shock as she walked back to the cave, she almost forgot to get her collecting basket from the place she had hidden it before deciding to track the fox. Ayla! What happened to you? You're all muddy! Isa motioned when she saw her. The girl's face was ashen. Something must have scared her. Ayla didn't answer. She just shook her head and went into the cave. Isa knew there was something the girl didn't want to tell her. She thought of pressing her further, then changed her mind, hoping the child would tell her voluntarily. And Isa wasn't so sure she wanted to know. It bothered the woman when Ayla went off by herself, but someone needed to gather her medicinal plants. They were necessary. 
She couldn't go. Oba was too young, and none of the other women knew what to look for or had any inclination to learn. She had to let Ayla go. But if the girl told her of some frightening incident, it would worry her all the more. She just wished Ayla wouldn't stay out so long. Ayla was subdued that evening and went to bed early, but she couldn't sleep. She lay awake thinking about the incident with the lynx, and in her imagination it became even more frightening. It was early morning before she finally dozed off. She woke up screaming. Ayla! Ayla! She heard Isa call her name as the woman shook her gently to bring her back to reality. What's wrong? I dreamed I was in a little cave and a cave lion was after me. I'm all right now, Isa. You haven't had bad dreams for a long time, Ayla. Why should you have them now? Did something frighten you today? Ayla nodded and bowed her head but didn't explain. The dark of the cave, lit only by the dim glow of red coals, hid her guilty expression. She hadn't felt guilty about hunting since she found the sign from her totem. Now she wondered if it really was a sign. Maybe she just thought it was. Maybe she wasn't supposed to hunt after all, especially such dangerous animals. Whatever made her think a girl should be trying to hunt lynxes? I have never liked the idea of your going out alone, Ayla. You're always gone so long. I know you like to get off by yourself sometimes, but it worries me. It's not natural for girls to want to be alone so much. The forest can be dangerous. You're right, Isa. The forest can be dangerous. Ayla motioned. Maybe next time I can take Oba with me. Or maybe Ika would like to go. Isa was relieved to see that Ayla seemed to be taking her advice to heart. She hung around the cave, and when she did go out after medicinal plants, she returned quickly. When she couldn't get someone to go with her, she was nervous. She kept expecting to see a crouching animal ready to spring. She began to understand why women of the clan didn't like to go out alone to gather food and why her eagerness to be off by herself always surprised them. When she was younger, she was just too innocent of the dangers, but it took only one attack, and most of the women had felt threatened at least once, to make her look upon her environment with more respect. Even a non-predator could be dangerous. Boars with sharp canines, horses with hard hooves, stags with heavy antlers, mountain goats and sheep with lethal horns. All of them could inflict serious damage if aroused. Ayla wondered how she ever dared to think about hunting. She was afraid to go again. There was no one Ayla could talk to about it, no one to tell her a little fear sharpened the senses, especially when stalking dangerous game, no one to encourage her to go out again before the fear inhibited her. The men understood fear. They didn't talk about it, but every one of them had known it many times in their lives, beginning with their first major hunt that elevated them to men. Small animals were for practice, to gain skill with their weapon, but manhood status was not granted until they had known and overcome fear. For a woman... Her days spent alone away from the safety of the clan were no less a test of bravery, though more subtle. In some ways it required more courage to face those days and nights alone, knowing that no matter what happened she was on her own. From the time she was born, a girl always had other people around her, protecting her. But she had no weapons to bring to her own defense and no weapon-bearing protective male to save her during her rites of passage. Girls, as well as boys, did not become adults until they had faced and overcome fear. For the first few days, Ayla had no desire to wander far from the cave. But after a while, she became restless. In winter, she had no choice and accepted her confinement to the cave with the rest 
but she had grown accustomed to roaming freely when the weather was warm. Ambivalence tormented her. When she was alone in the forest, away from the security of the clan, she was uneasy and apprehensive. When she was with the clan near the cave, she longed for the privacy and freedom of the forest. One foraging expedition, when she was out alone, brought her close to her private retreat, and she climbed the rest of the way to the high meadow. The place had a soothing effect on her. It was her private world, her cave, her meadow. She felt possessive about the small herd of roe deer that frequently grazed there. They had become so tame she could get close enough to almost touch one before it pranced out of range. The open field gave her a sense of security, lacking now in the dangerous woods that hid lurking beasts. She hadn't visited the place at all this season, and memories came flooding back. This was where she first taught herself to use the sling, where she hit the porcupine, and where she had found the sign from her totem. She had her sling with her. She didn't dare to leave it in the cave for Isa to find and after a while she picked up a few pebbles and made a few practice shots. But that was far too tame a sport to interest her for long now. Her mind went back to the incident with the lynx. If only I'd had another stone to sling, she thought. If I could have hit him right away, right after the stone that missed, I might have gotten him before he had a chance to jump. She had two pebbles in her hand and looked at them both. If there was only a way to throw one right after the other. Had Zug ever said anything like that to Vorn? She racked her brain trying to remember. If he had, it must have been when I wasn't around, she decided. She pondered the idea. If I could get a second stone in the pocket on the downstroke, after the first hurl, without stopping it, I could throw it on the next upstroke. I wonder if that would work. She began making a few tries and felt as clumsy as she had the first time she tried to use a sling. Then she began to develop a rhythm. Throw the first stone, catch the sling as it comes down, with the second stone ready, get in the pocket while it's still moving, throw the second stone. The pebbles dropped often and even after she began to lob them, her accuracy on both shots suffered. But she was satisfied that it could be done. She returned every day after that to practice. She felt uneasy about hunting, but the challenge of working out the new techniques renewed her interest in the weapon. By the time the forested hillsides were ablaze with the turning season, she was as accurate with two stones as she had been with one. Standing in the middle of the field hurling stones at a new post she had pounded into the ground, she felt a warm sense of accomplishment when a satisfactory thwack-thwack told her both stones had hit the mark. No one told her it was impossible to rapid-fire two stones from a sling, because it had never been done before. And since no one told her she couldn't, she taught herself to do it. Early one warm day in late fall, Nearly a year from the time she first made her decision to hunt, Ayla decided to climb to the high pasture to collect the mature hazelnuts that had fallen to the ground. As she drew near the top, she heard the whooping and cackling and snuffling of a hyena, and when she reached the meadow, she saw one of the ugly beasts half buried in the bloody entrails of an old roe deer. It made her mad. How Dare that noisome creature defile her meadow, attack her deer. She started to run toward the hyena to scare him off, then thought better of it. Hyenas were predators, too, with jaws strong enough to crack the large leg bones of grazing ungulates, and not easily chased from their own prey. She quickly shrugged off her basket and reached to the bottom of it for her sling. She scanned the ground for stones as she edged toward an outcrop near the rock wall. The old stag was half devoured, but her movement caught the attention of the scraggly spotted animal, nearly as large as the lynx. The hyena looked up, found her scent, and turned in her direction. She was ready. 
Stepping out from behind the outcrop, she hurled a missile, followed quickly by a second. She didn't know the second was unnecessary. The first had done the job. But it was good insurance. Ayla had learned her lesson. She had a third stone in her sling and a fourth in hand, prepared for a second series if it proved necessary. The cave hyena had crumpled on the spot and didn't move. She looked around to make sure there were no more nearby, then cautiously moved toward the beast, her sling ready. On her way, she picked up a leg bone, a few sh shreds of red meat still clinging to it and not yet broken. With a skull-cracking blow, Ayla made sure the hyena would not rise again. She looked at the dead animal at her feet and let the club fall from her hand. Awareness of the implications of her deed came slowly. I killed a hyena, she said to herself as the impact hit her. I killed a hyena with my sling. Not a small animal, a hyena. An animal that could kill me. Does that mean I'm a hunter now? Really a hunter? It was an exultation, she felt. Not the excitement of a first kill or even the satisfaction of overcoming a powerful beast. It was something deeper, more humbling. It was the knowledge that she had overcome herself. It came as a spiritual revelation, a mystical insight. And with a reverence deeply felt, she spoke to the spirit of her totem in the ancient formal language of the clan. I am only a girl, great cave lion, and the ways of the spirits are strange to me. But I think I understand a little more now. The lynx was a test even more than browed. Kreb always said powerful totems are not easy to live with. But he never told me the greatest gifts they give are inside. He never told me how it feels when you finally understand. The test is not just something hard to do. The test is knowing you can do it. I am grateful you chose me, great cave lion. I hope I will always be worthy of you. As the brilliant polychrome autumn lost its luster and skeletal branches dropped withered leaves, Ayla returned to the forest. She tracked and studied the habits of the animals she chose to hunt, but she treated them with more respect, both as creatures and as dangerous adversaries. Many times, though she crept close enough to hurl a stone, she refrained and merely watched. She developed a stronger feeling that it was a waste to kill an animal who did not threaten the clan and whose pelt she could not use. But she was still determined to be the best sling hunter in the clan. She didn't realize she already was. The only way she could continue to increase her skill was to hunt, and hunt she did. The results were beginning to be noticed, and it made the men uneasy. I found another wolverine, or what was left of it, not far from the practice field, Krug motioned. And there were pieces of fur, looked like a wolf, over the ridge halfway down the hill, Goove added. It's always the meat-eaters, the stronger animals, not female totems, Browd said. Grod says we should talk to Mogor. Small and medium-sized ones, but not the big cats. Deer and horses, sheep and mountain goats. Even boars are always hunted by the big cats and wolves and hyenas. But what's hunting the smaller hunters? I've never seen so many of them killed, Krog remarked. That's what I'd like to know. What's killing them? It's not that I mind a few less hyenas or wolves around, but if it's not us... Is Grodd going to talk to Mogor? Do you think he could be a spirit? The young man quelled a shudder. And if it is a spirit, is it a good spirit who is helping us, or an evil spirit who is angry at our totems? Goove asked. Leave it to you, Goove, to come up with a question like that. You're Mogor's acolyte. 
What do you think? Krug returned. I think it will take deep meditation and consultation with the spirits to answer that question. You already sound like a Mogor, Goove. Never give a direct answer, Browd quipped. Well, what's your answer, Browd? The acolyte countered. Can you give one any more direct? What's killing the animals? I'm not a Mogor or even training to be one. Don't ask me. Ayla was working nearby and repressed a desire to smile. So now I'm a spirit, but they can't figure out if I'm a good one or a bad one. Mogor approached unnoticed, but he had seen the discussion. I don't have an answer yet, Browd, the magician motioned. It will take meditation, but I will say this. It is not the normal way of spirits. Spirits, Mogor thought to himself, might make it too hot or too cold, or bring too much rain or snow, or drive herds away or bring disease, or make thunder or lightning or earthquakes. But they don't usually cause the death of individual animals. This mystery has the feel of a human hand. Ayla got up and walked to the cave, and the magician watched her go. There's something different about her. She has changed, Crab mused. He noticed Browd's eyes had followed her, too, and they were filled with frustrated malice. Browd's noticed the difference, too. Maybe it's just that she's not really clan and walks differently. She is growing up. Something nagged at the edge of his mind that made Kreb feel that wasn't the answer. Ayla had changed. As her hunting skill grew, she developed an assurance and sinewy grace unknown to clan women. She had the silent walk of an experienced hunter, a tight muscular control of her young body, a confidence in her own reflexes, and a far-seeing look in her eye that clouded over imperceptibly whenever Browd began to harass her, as though she wasn't really seeing him. She jumped just as quickly to his commands, but her response lacked the edge of fear no matter how he cuffed her. Her composure, her confidence, was far more intangible, but no less apparent to Browd than the near-open rebellion of earlier times. It was as though she was condescending to obey him, as though she knew something he didn't. He watched her, trying to discern the subtle shift, trying to find something to punish her for, but it eluded him. Brown didn't know how she did it, but every time he tried to assert his superiority, she made him feel below her, inferior to her. It frustrated him, infuriated him, but the more he kept after her, the less control he felt over her, and he hated her for it. But gradually, he found himself harassing her less, even staying away from her, only occasionally remembering to demonstrate his prerogatives. As the season came to an end, his hatred intensified. Someday he would break her he vowed to himself. Some day he would make her pay for the wounds she inflicted on his self-esteem. Oh, yes, some day she would be sorry 